Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. And I also want to say thank you to everyone who's joining us uh, virtually this evening from their, uh, the comfort of their own homes and staying out of the rain. So my name is Scott Bradley. I'm the executive director of the Thunder Bay Museum. And I would like to begin tonight by acknowledging the original custodians of this land uh, and pay my respects to the elders past, present, and future. For they hold the memories, the traditions, the culture, and the hopes of indigenous peoples. We recognize that we are meeting on the traditional land of Fort William First Nation, signatory to the Robinson Superior Treaty of 1850, and to acknowledge the role of the Métis settlement in the development of our community. Uh, so a bit of housekeeping, um, there will be refreshments after the, uh, uh, the presentation, and this lecture is being recorded, so if you do have a, some sort of smart device or something that's gonna make noise in your pocket, please do turn that off. And there will be time for questions and answers after the presentation. Now, Gary, uh, or I should say Dr. Gary Polanski, has asked me to do a very detailed introduction for him so that everyone has this in context. So, without, uh, so yeah, here's Gary. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Well, uh, I want to begin by stating that I want to dedicate this uh, presentation to Boris Brott, to the memory of Boris Brott. Uh, without Boris, uh, there wouldn't be a Thunder Bay Symphony as we know it, and without it, there probably wouldn't be a community auditorium at all. So rest in peace, uh, Boris. I also want to acknowledge uh, Scott Bradley and Michael DeJong, two people who uh, are the leadership of this museum, uh, whom I didn't know uh, until very recently, and who are fantastic. These guys are fantastic. Uh, they made everything easy, everything right. So uh, if you like any of this at all, 80% of the credit goes, goes to them. And I also want to acknowledge Trevor Hurdy who's the acting GM of the auditorium. He was very helpful. And as a bit of a fluke, Trevor's grandmother was my mother's best friend. And they spoke on the phone every single day. So it's a small world. Uh, so thank you for being here. Thank you if you're online. Uh, I'll probably go for around almost an hour and uh, you know, uh, if I have grandchildren uh, watching, as I think I do, a special uh, hello to them. And I also want to give a special shout out to someone in the room without whom there would be no auditorium. And you probably know who I mean. And I'm talking about Clint Kushak. So congratulations, Clint, and thank you. Uh, and I also thought I'll quote uh, Boswell uh, on uh, uh, Mr. Johnson, on page 234 of my uh, edition, where he says, people who return to their, oh, so we actually have a picture. Well, let, let's do a couple of slides first here. So there we go. Just before, and maybe one more. So these two are, uh, the, the previous slide and this one, are slides of the uh, new uh, Canada Museum of Science and Te Technology and the new Archives Museum. Uh, and I was honored to be chair of the board while we planned and built uh, these, these edifices for over a quarter of a billion dollars. And they're really beautiful. And until I received this fluke phone call one day asking me to become chair of the museum board, uh, I knew nothing about museums. Uh, and so, uh, but I learned over the nine years that I had that privilege and so I came into this museum knowing a little bit more about museums than I did a dozen years ago. And I can tell you this place has every reason to be very proud of it and the people of Thunder Bay and Northwestern Ontario because it really is a, a terrific place. But if we could skip forward to uh, this, is why we're here, of course, the community auditorium, and we'll go to the next slide. Uh, and there's Boris, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, so there is Samuel Johnson, and he once said that when a person returns to his hometown, and Thunder Bay is my hometown, uh, to speak, 
uh, he or she has the tendency to be irksome and tumid. So I knew what irksome meant because I've been accused of that often enough, but I had no idea what tumid meant. So I went to the dictionary and it turns out that it means ostentatious or pompous. And I'll do my best uh, to prove Samuel Johnson wrong uh, in the next hour or so. So uh, moving to my next preliminary point and last one, uh, about uh, the community auditorium, I wanted to just comment on the impact that Thunder Bay had on me. And there's actually a, a uh, thing about my family on the second floor exhibition that if you have a minute to breeze by it, you'll see that my roots are clearly in Thunder Bay. So I just want to speak about the impact of it on me and the impact of the community auditorium on my life. Uh, because I would argue that uh, they're both kind of uh, profound. So starting with uh, the community auditorium, uh, my last full-time job, I had the amazing and surprising honor of being the founding president of, the, uh, of Canada's newest university, now known as Ontario Tech University, uh, which in fact is known as the up-and-coming MIT of the North. Canada's MIT. Uh, so Canada didn't have an MIT until this one was created. Of course, in the States, they have dozens of them, right? Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech, Michigan Tech, Rensselaer, and of course, MIT itself and Cal Poly, and you can go on and on. And here we are, a uh, leading nation on the manufacturing and technology and science side without even one. And I thought, that's just dumb. So I went on the kind of binge uh, that I learned about with the auditorium that we'll be speaking about, and lo and behold, uh, it happened. So I want to make uh, just six, six comparisons between Ontario Tech University and the auditorium. First, they're both huge. Uh, you know, a 1,550-seat concert hall is a big deal uh, in a city of 500,000 let alone 120,000. Uh, they were both hopelessly improbable. The huge majority of people who even thought about it hated the idea. Uh, and therefore, many of them decided they would hate me. And those of you who were around in the 60s uh, will maybe remember uh, some of that. And a fourth point is that it was hugely controversial and an enormous struggle uh, and we will cover some of the uh, details about that. The fifth point, though, is that they both happened. So that's worth noticing. Uh, and the sixth uh, is that they always had abundant crises. Uh, and I'll speak to some about the, in the auditorium. On the university side, you may not know, because few people do, uh, that one month into the start of the university, a new government was elected in Ontario, and it decided to shut down Ontario Tech University. And I got a phone call later in a Friday afternoon informing me that the check, the $385 million check that I was spending like blazes on buildings and research capacity and all of that had been torn up. So good luck, Gary. So I would call that a crisis. And we had our fair share of those, as Clint will remember, uh, on this journey. And so you can see how one sort of informed me uh, as to how to carry on with the subsequent ones that crossed my path. And finally, before I get into the auditorium itself, I want to acknowledge that Thunder Bay uh, was a wonderful place uh, to grow up. Uh, it was so good. It brings tears to my eyes. Every time I talk about it or visit it, um, and I'll just mention a few things. Uh, if we can go to uh, maybe, uh, well, we did have a two-minute clipping of the university, which we could pass on. Show of hands, who wants a two-minute clip on the MIT of Canada? Okay, the majority speaks, so here goes. Thank you. 
has enough. So if we had carried on, you would have seen uh, students who have just developed a, a, a kind of arm prosthetic that they can do virtually anything as though you know, it was a regular arm with a regular hand. And that's the kind of research that's going on there. So, uh, and we have a student president, former student president from the university, Thomas Collins. So uh, he'll recall some of that. So anyway, um, I want to uh, just quickly summarize my memories of Thunder Bay and then move right directly to the auditorium. So if we go to the next slide, um, that's where I was born and raised in the, uh, that, what is now called the Parkwood Apartments, uh, right next to the Royal uh, Beer Parlor uh, on the corner of Bay and Court Street. And, uh, you know, it was an interesting place to grow up. Uh, for example, I had a friend whose mother was the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. And amazingly, my friend had a different father every night. And this father brought him this great gift. Uh, and then he would spend the evening with us and we would be playing with his new gift. So you get the rest of the picture. Uh, I had another family whose, uh, whose mother, whose, uh, the, the mother was a very good friend of my mother. And uh, her husband was a big uh, construction guy. And uh, one night, one of the drunks from the well interfered with his daughter climbing up the stairs uh, with uh, her laundry from having done it in the basement. And he picked up this guy and threw him off right through the glass door and he smashed his head on the sidewalk uh, right there on, uh, on Court Street. And uh, another memory was that Mrs. Beccari, who owned the Royal Home for years, uh, she let me sell lemonade in the bar at three cents a glass uh, during the war because I think she figured out we could use the money. Uh, and so, you know, from then, uh, we went to Fort William Collegiate and uh, University and married and kids and was working at Confederation College and uh, Wayne Teixeira is here to acknowledge that. And uh, one day, uh, my boss, Don Dingwall, said, Gary, why don't you try and start up a trades department? I said, Don, I don't know anything about trades. I'm the last guy you really want, he said, ah, just do it. I have, I have a good feeling about it. And I had no idea what to do. I was about 25, maybe. Uh, I knew nothing about trades, but I was a bridge player, a duplicate bridge player. And I remember when we were playing in the labor center every Tuesday and Friday night, that as we went after the game to the bar, we would pass all these offices, the iron workers and, you know, the electricians and the carpenters and you name it. And I thought, well, maybe I should go and ask those guys if they have any advice. And the truth is, those guys adopted me. They thought it was a great idea that Northwestern Ontario would have a trades training thing. And they wanted to make sure that it was done right. And so they got us the best faculty, such as Brian Campbell from the, uh, the logging program, uh, but Bud McDowell and George Heinrich from the welders and and uh, you know, Jerry Stewart and and uh, Stan uh, Stan Blucher. Blucher, right? Thanks, Brian, from the heavy equipment program, and on and on and on. These are spectacular people. George Rasick. These these were union presidents. Most of them were union presidents. It's not easy to become and stay the president of the Iron Workers Union. So these guys had the right stuff. And even though I was their boss, they taught me everything. Um, and, and it was a success. Uh, you know, we had over 6,000 students in a year, 24 programs. We had 24-hour-a-day programs. Imagine full-time unionized faculty working 24 hours a day in three shifts. Unheard of. Uh, and it all stemmed from, from dealing with the best people, such as Clint, such as others whom I'll mention as we go through this. And just before I finish this up, so I ran once for the school board. Wayne was on it. Lynn McLeod was our chair. I don't know anyone who's smarter than Lynn McLeod. 
And I, I just learned an enormous amount about leadership at her knee without her even realizing it. And the last point I'll mention is uh, I'm Jewish and, uh, and there's a Holocaust exhibition going on here. And I was born during all that. Uh, and my grandfather, in fact, was the longest serving rabbi of Thunder Bay, and his picture is on the second floor. Uh, but the God's truth is, uh, I never experienced one ounce of anti-Semitism in the 39 plus years that I lived here, not an ounce. And uh, I have a friend who, uh, who Rob actually probably knows is a leading researcher that was brought to the Thunder Bay uh, Regional Health Research Institute. Uh, and this guy is incredibly brilliant, and he could work anywhere. He could work at Mayo, in Boston, anywhere, John Hopkins. And I asked him one day, I said, why are you staying in Thunder Bay? I know we brought you here from the old country, but you speak perfect English now. Why are you staying here? And he answered, Gary, uh, he's not a young man, he's not an old man, but he's not a young man. He said, Gary, I've been around the world. This is the first time of my life, no one seems to give a damn that I'm a Jew. And so he stayed in Thunder Bay. So, you know, all of that sort of uh, helps probably to, helps us background uh, to uh, the reason that you're all here tonight, which is to learn about the history of the auditorium. So here goes. I've got 20 points of which number 20 is questions and answers. So 19 points. First point is why me? How did I get to become the board chair of the project? It was a total fluke. I was a punk. As you've heard, I played bridge. Uh, one of my uh, partners was John R. Blasters, who's known to some of us, now living a very nice life in Cheltenham, England. Um, and, uh, John said as he was driving to uh, the bridge game, he said, I've got to stop off for a minute because uh, I have a board meeting and I, I just want to apologize that I'm not going to stay. And it was freezing out, you know, 45 below, something like that. So he insisted that I come in with him. Uh, and since I was in, uh, people said, oh, would you like to join the board? I, I, I didn't know what a board was. I had no idea. Uh, but they seemed like people, and who could argue with a concert hall in your hometown? So I thought, okay. Uh, and then about a couple of months later, uh, I had to miss a meeting, and Danny O'Gorman, who was the president and former chair of president of our hospital, uh, had, was leaving Thunder Bay to be president of a hospital out west. And you know what happens when you miss a board meeting? <laughs> Right. So, I mean, others of you may have been victimized by this in, in yourselves. Suddenly, I wake up the next morning to learn I'm the board chair. And that's how this 25 year old punk became board chair of the auditorium. Um, but I also thought, you know, uh, one reason I kind of wasn't too all apologetic about this is that I actually thought we deserved it. You know, it's not easy when you're working. Uh, in the bush, or in, or in a mill, uh, or in a mine, or in a hospital, or in a school, or anywhere. I mean, people in Thunder Bay work hard, and as a bonus, it's 2,500 kilometers between Toronto and Winnipeg. We are the heart of this country, geographically. And unless we're strong, and feeling good about ourselves, and feeling good about the country, uh, who knows you know, what, what might happen. So I just thought, you know, we deserved it. So that takes me to my second point, which was my first meeting at City Hall. And of course, I knew nothing. I had never been to a meeting before. I assumed the best, that everyone was respectful, everyone was kind. Uh, and then I walked into this buzzsaw, which, uh, Scott, maybe we could play the next video. No? Yeah. There you go. We'll just play about a minute of this. Some of you will recognize. I want to hear you, John. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just going to thank you because these are the kind of things that we ask for in the report, and I think that's what they're well where they are here. You know, Mr. Rapino, I'd like to know what you've been doing, been doing in the last while. 
<laughs> you're never here. Right? You're back in person. You're out of order. Be quiet. You're you're in Toronto all the time, trying to correct the mistake you made in Victoria Bell. And again, this is going to come up the next two weeks. You have egg all over your face. That's enough. Let me get the pictures, Scott. So uh, that was what I uh, stumbled into uh, at my first council meeting. And uh, I, my third point actually is about Walter Asif. Uh, because Walter was mayor for 10 years, right? Not 10 months, 10 years. And he had a, a lot of support in this town. And of course, he was a character. And some of us remember the, the moment when he hosted Her Majesty. And if you don't, then uh, read about it. Uh, but, you know, I believe he was sincere. And, uh, and besides, he was the mayor. And Clinton, I continue to try personally to bring him on board. And I would meet with him privately. Uh, and he was, always, he was always polite to me. Never berated me, as you're seeing here. Uh, and I'll, I'll just tell you about, you'll hear a lot of people say, especially amongst the so-called intelligentsia, that they would never vote for Walter. He's such a clown. He's such a this and such a that. So here's a true story. Uh, I'm meeting in his office the, the morning after a major snowstorm. And he's surrounded on his desk by an arc of red telephones. Uh, and they never stop ringing. And he answers them all personally. And so this is exactly a, a, a live conversation. Picks up the phone. Hello, dearie. Don't you worry. I know why you're calling. It'll be looked after before noon. Take care. I love you. Dials another number. Joe, Mrs. Korbakowski. I got you, your worship. Don't you worry. I'll have a strapping great eight-year-old down there to shovel her out right now. Call after call after call. He micromanaged the city uh, from that arc of phones uh, in a way that some people would say, that's not his job. A mayor's job is to be strategic, etc. Well, not according to Walter. He looked after his constituency, and he was mayor for 10 years. So I'll take you then to uh, my, my fourth point is I entitled it, We Kept Plugging. Uh, if you were around in those days, you'll know it wasn't easy. And so I was out four or five nights a week, uh, church, basement, service clubs, IODE, you mentioned it, uh, including town hall meetings. And my fifth point is to tell you about a particular town hall meeting you may find interesting with Joe Vanderweese's at McIntyre. And I forget, Clint, were you there at that one? I think so, yeah. You were, okay. So you'll remember then that we, when he arrived, it was a terrible night, uh, and uh, but suddenly we were confronted by by a, uh, a platoon of bikers. Somebody had invited the, a biker gang to be the welcoming party for us at this community hall meeting, and uh, there was a plank leading into the uh, into the hall over the mud, and these guys were literally. Uh, you know, lining the plank, and I had to walk the plank or decide not to. And I quickly decided to do it. So, uh, you know, the, the, the hall was packed. It was jammed, standing room only. And uh, I began. And about five minutes into my talk, uh, this enormous guy, a biker, uh, walked up the side of the room to the little table that uh, I had in front of me, and he slammed a $2 bill, which some of you will remember, onto the table. And, and right after I had mentioned that it would cost the average middle-class family $1.75 or a bottle of beer per year in order to sustain the auditorium so that ticket prices could be affordable for all. And so he came up, slammed the $2 bill, and said, if that's true, then you can even have my vote. And he then sauntered back, and I reached into my pocket, praying I could find what I was looking for, and pure luck, I, I did. And I took out the quarter, and I, I said, sir, and he stopped. 
and I flipped him the quarter, and I said, you forgot your change. <laughs> well, he burst into laughter, thank goodness, because it could have gone the other way. And, and he said, uh, well, anyway, the, the, the place erupted into laughter, it set a good tone, uh, and Joe, I think, Joe Vanderwees, felt good about the, uh, the meeting uh, at the end of the night. Uh, and when we left, uh, you know, down the plank, the biker guys uh, were friendly, right? Not intimidating as on the way in. They were very friendly and nice on the way out. Thank goodness. Which takes me to the sixth point, that there was work to be done. Uh, what were we going to build? Where would we build it? How much would it cost? How long would it take? Where would the money come from, et cetera? All of the usual questions. So I knew nothing about this. So we needed knowledge. We needed expertise. We needed the best. And it was sort of a lesson that I learned from the trades building. If you start off with the Bud McDowell's of the world, uh, then you'll probably land on your feet. So uh, you know that applied in our case to the architect, the acoustician, the theater designer, the management people, and so on. And we only had three goals, on time, on budget, rave reviews. So we had to nail three for three. And that takes me to the seventh point was, who was the team? So we decided we should start with the acoustician because in a concert hall, acoustics are everything. Well, there was only one master acoustician alive at that time probably the greatest one to ever live. Uh, and that was Russell Johnson from New York City. So we asked Russell if he would take us on, and he did. Uh, and he brought his own theater designer, Bob Wolf. Uh, and we ended up choosing Trevor Garvin Jones as our architect, who had just done a great job in designing Hamilton Place, and he had done others. But it wasn't just Trevor. We made sure there was work for all of the four major local architect firms, and they partnered with Trevor. This went on this, that went on that. We each had a chunk of the project to feel proud and to uh, help pay the bills. And of course, there was Clint, Clint Kushak, uh, who was the only paid person uh, at the top general manager, was there forever, made peanuts, uh, but uh, without Clint, uh, none of us would be here today. Which takes me to 3.8. Uh, research. Uh, we really didn't know still what we were talking about. And so we thought we better go and kind of learn. So we made uh, one or two cheap trips, uh, but they were meaningful uh, because we wanted to see what others had done, hear what they have done, ask questions. I remember uh, one anecdote is that we visited Karen Kane just after a performance in her dressing room because we wanted to ask about dance. Were you there that time? Yes. So you'll remember, uh, her mother was there, her manager was there, I think his name was David Haber. Um, and uh, about five minutes into our spiel, Karen King began to cry. And so I thought, oh my God, I've offended her somehow. And I, so I asked her, why are you crying? And she said, you know, no one ever asks the artists. You guys are asking the artists, and I just feel it. Uh, and she mentioned, actually, uh, that if we could ever find a grove of Sitka spruce, that would be the best floor for dancers. Because as you probably know, they're injured all the time. It's like being an NHL defenseman. It's a terrible way to earn a living, apart from the artistic, artistic magic of it all. So, uh, but the world had pretty well run out of uh, spruces. And I was telling the story uh, Monday morning in the coffee uh, room of the trades building. And the late Jerry Stewart said, you know, I've got a grove up north and it's Sitka spruce and you can have it. And that's how the auditorium ended up with the perfect floor for Karen Kane, thanks to Jerry Stewart. So point nine is entitled, The City Council Saga Continues. So I would be there every four to six months 
for some update or another operating money, location, ultimately approval, capital money, and so on. And I think we always won, but usually we won by seven to six, occasionally eight to five, a landslide was nine to four. Um, and so it was tight. And we would always fill the room with our supporters uh, because that matters. And I uh, noted one of those moments. Uh, it was a key vote. And I asked uh, His Excellency, Bishop O'Mara, if he would uh, join the crowd that night at council. Because uh, it's a big deal to have the bishop there, as it is to have, you know, all kinds of other people as well. So he came and he was just sitting behind us. And about a minute into my spiel, Walter Asif began to wail, just wail. And then he began to knock his head on his desk. And then he began to scream, God damn it, golden boy, which is kind of a nickname he had for me. Now you've got me in trouble with my God. How dare you? And he's, he's weeping. He's really taking this very seriously. And it's nonstop. Like it's, it's lasting two minutes, three minutes, five minutes. And so you can imagine, I have no idea what to do. Uh, but uh, I did look behind to the bishop and he looked at me as, as I didn't know what to do but finally he knew what to do he stood up remember this man he walked up the middle of the council chamber up to where the mayor's desk is and he cradled Walter in his arms and he said it's okay Walter it's okay Everything's going to be okay. And after a couple of minutes of that, it seemed as though Walter was kind of settling. But then and one of the aldermen, who was a staunch supporter of the project, got caught up in the emotion, and that was Rita Ubriaco. And God bless Rita, but she began to wail and slam her head on the desk in front of her. Both strong Catholics. So uh, the bishop found himself jockeying between Rita and Walter, right? And uh, I mean, this is quite a story. I could go on and on, but you get the picture and you get the kind of drama that was associated with this project from the get-go till the very end, which takes me to the 10th point, 3.10. Um, you know, if it was going to happen, uh, God knows Gary Palancy and who knows who the hell he even was, uh, was not going to do it. You needed support from the key people in the community. And eventually you need philanthropy from those people. And so many of you will recognize these two people. Chuck Carter was the owner and president of Great Lakes Paper. And Mr. Badani, of course, was the mayor and MP from Fort William. And so... Uh, we set up a meeting with Mr. Carter. You were there, Clint, for that one? Yes. So I've got to tell the truth here because I have a witness. To it. So, uh, but I always would tell the truth. So uh, Mr. Carter was very nice. He had coffee laid out. And he said, you know, Gary, just save you a little bit of time. He said, let, let me do this. And he tore off a little corner of a napkin. And he wrote three names on that little corner of the napkin. And he asked, do you have any of these on your team or as supporters? And I didn't know who two of them were, uh, but I knew Hubert Badani. Everyone knew Hubert Badani, uh, who was the mayor. But more than that, he was my dad's boss forever. Uh, and they got along great. And so I, I knew of him. I didn't know him. But anyway, I said, yes, Mr. Badani is a strong supporter. And he said, good. He said, good. If Bert, as he called him, if Bert's in, you can count me in and you can count my company in. We'll be there for you. And that took about four minutes. So I thought, well, Mr. Carter, that's, I mean, that's amazing. But do you want to learn a little bit about the project? And I had come prepared, right? I was color coded and cross referenced, and you can imagine. And he surprised me by saying, no, no. He said, that's okay. 
He said, but, and he said this, he said, Gary, when you get to be my age, you learn that the only question you really have to ask yourself before arriving at a decision is who? Who's for it? Who's with me? You know, the other stuff is important. What, where, when, why, how much, and all that. But he said, who? That's the cruncher. And if you've got Bert, then you've, you've nailed the who. And besides, he said, I actually have a busy day. Remember, he said, I've got a busy day lined up. And so if you'll forgive me, I'm going to get on with my day. And we took that cue and left. But we had Mr. Carter and we had Great Lakes Paper. So um, this takes me, I think, to point 11. Uh, we we're feeling pretty good. And if we can go to the next slide, this is my son on the right and his friend Eric on the left, both uh, hockey players for a volunteer pool, as you can see. And one night, uh, Eric's mother invited us, our family, to their home for Thanksgiving evening, Thanksgiving dinner. And we had a wonderful evening. And uh, around two minutes to 11, uh, apparently it was their habit to uh, turn on the 11 o'clock news. So said, sure. She said, do you mind if we turn on the news? I said, of course not, turn on the news. And there was Rick Smith. And if we can just go to good old Rick, and Rick, some of you will remember, was uh, very famous and the only uh, talk show host of his kind in Thunder Bay. And uh, he always was ripping into me for the uh, community auditorium, but this time he went way above and beyond. It was very personal. It was incredibly nasty. And there I was with my own kids listening to this. Uh, and I just found it hard to take. So the next day, I stormed into my lawyer's office. Many of you will know my lawyer. I won't mention him. But if I tell you that he became a judge, you can probably guess who he was. And we were childhood friends forever. Uh, and uh, and I sang a sula You know, I had great Thunder Bay swear words coming out of me, you know, left and right. And he said, you know, Gary, 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 we've been friends forever, but you just don't get it. You're still so damn young and dumb. I said, okay, why am I young and dumb? He said, Gary, this has, first of all, he says, I'm happy to be your lawyer, but I never make a nickel off you. You should know I'm also CKPR's lawyer. <laughs> and they pay my bills. And I actually rehearsed Rick uh, when, I'm, when I think he may be in danger of slipping over the threshold of uh, libel and slander. And I knew Fraser well uh, and, and his wife, and, you know, and whenever I spoke to him, even Rick Smith personally, it was always very gentle, very supportive, very respectful. And then the next day he'd turn around and he'd crucify me. Uh, and as my lawyer said to me, Gary, yes, because it's all about ratings. It has nothing to do with you. It has nothing to do with the auditorium. It's all about ratings. Rick helps Fraser pay the bills. That's the bottom line. And then he said, so let's go for lunch. And that's the story about Rick, but I will mention him uh, one more time uh, as, we, as we come to that. So now number 12. Uh, 12, I've titled, The Thunder Bay Art Center is Dead. So uh, I'm at another council meeting. The room is packed. We had just done our assessment as to what we could afford to build and to operate. And uh, I was among those who concluded we could not afford to build the Thunder Bay Art Center, which you may recall had three major components, the auditorium, the smaller theater, and the art gallery. So uh, I you know, started my speech and I said, your worship, counselors, friends in the back, I have a bit of a whopper to lay on you right now. 
and that is the Thunder Bay Art Center project is dead. You can imagine the reaction, especially the reaction behind me from my friends. So I let that ride for a minute. And then I said, however, we can afford to build a world-class concert hall. And the other two components will just have to wait their time. And the right time will come in the right place and it'll all be good. And as you know, that prediction, many of my predictions turn out to be wrong. That particular one turned out to be right because Magnus, we know about, and the art gallery, we know about. And I'm told the art gallery may end up uh, as a new form in, at the waterfront. And wouldn't that be uh, particularly astonishing? And so TBAC, Thunder Bay Art Center, became TBCA, Thunder Bay Community Auditorium. And that's how that happened. So now we're at point 13, location. Rob, you have to stay awake for this, for this one. Okay. So we had a location. Uh, we sort of liked it. It was pretty good. It wasn't fantastic, but it was okay. And it was owned by Senator Patterson. So I wrote him. And uh, he wrote me back, and he declined. It was very summarily, actually. Not, not uh, nasty, but summarily. So I was kind of taken aback by that. Uh, and after about a month or two, I thought, I'll try again. So I wrote him again. And months went by and no reply. I figured, well, that's it. And then one day we got a reply. And it, it, the reply went something like this. Young man, uh, I wasn't expecting to hear from you again. Uh, and I was annoyed that I, that I did. Uh, and I decided not to write you back. But then I realized you're young and you mean well. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just conclude this letter with this personal anecdote. When I arrived in Thunder Bay, I didn't have five cents to my name. Zero. Today, I own so many uh, cargo ships, so many grain elevators, the Royal Edward Hotel, and it went on and on and on. It was a pretty impressive list. And he said, I can sum up why my life turned from poverty to wealth in two words, good decisions, such as my decision about your site, okay. Senator Patterson. So it turned out he was right, because the current site is better than the one that we, uh, we originally had thought. Which now takes me to point 14, the referendum. Those of you who were living here in 1976 will remember that was a cardinal moment in the history of Thunder Bay, September 28th, 1976. Um, after uh, years of what you've just been hearing from me, uh, the, the detractors of the project on council decided there's only one way to get rid of this guy because he's incorrigible, he won't go away. Uh, so we'll have a referendum. The overwhelming population percentage will vote against them, vote against the project, uh, and that'll be the end of it. So there was a, ref a referendum and, uh, and to probably everyone's surprise, maybe even including mine, we won. We won the referendum by a whopping 50.4%. But, you know, in our kind of government, the majority wins, and some, at least, of the naysayers on council uh, decided they would change their vote out of respect for the people. And so we went from losing uh, to uh, a vote uh, on approval, and they changed over, and we won that vote, not overwhelmingly, also by a bit of a squeaker, but we won. And so the project to, to build and go forward with the auditorium was passed officially at council. So, uh, and, you know, as was made clear to me afterward by a number of people, such as Lynn, uh, 
Lynn shared with me that if the referendum had lost, and she's empowered me to share this with you, if the referendum had lost, she and, her, and Neil, some of you will know, have known Dr. Neil McLeod, tremendous guy, they, were, they had decided to leave Thunder Bay. And lots of people of their ilk had decided to leave Thunder Bay. And Thunder Bay would not be uh, the better uh, for their departure. And then I got this letter, if we go to the, oh, and that person on the right, by the way, is in the audience. Stand up. Whoever is that crazy looking guy on the right, have the call, have the whatever, stand up. Be, re be counted. There he goes. <laughs> Brian Campbell, permitted, who was a tremendous lawyer and a tremendous faculty member and senior leader of Confederation College. Uh, that was Brian in the old days. And he permitted us to, uh, to use his picture because he was a strong supporter of the, of the auditorium. And if we go to the next slide, this is a letter from Mr. Badani. Uh, Dear Gary, oh, I should mention, I had written uh, a long piece for the, for the newspaper because I was leaving town for good. Uh, and his letter to me uh, was about my letter in the Chronicle Journal. And if you can read it, I read your letter on the auditorium. Your detailed summary in the Art Center saga is not only a story of great interest to the people of Thunder Bay, but a masterpiece of logic uh, with which I heartily agree, et cetera, et cetera, with best wishes, you were Badani. So as I mentioned before, I didn't really know Mr. Badani, uh, but he was a giant in this community. Uh, and I feel honored to, uh, to receive that letter. So now we'll go to uh, the next slide. You'll recognize at least one of those two people, Jack Masters, of course, on the right. The person on the left, you'll at least have heard of, uh, and that is uh, the late Honorable Francis Fox, who was Minister of All Things Cultural under the Trudeau government. And uh, so now it was point 12, point 15 here, is to raise the money. So it was the usual split, Ottawa, Queen's Park, city, private. And uh, we had worked forever to squeeze $3 million out of Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Uh, you know, brilliant as heck, as we all know, not always the easiest guy in the world to get along with. Uh, so it was a tough go, but, and, but God bless Jack Masters. He stuck by it and he hounded Francis, you know, till kingdom come. And one day uh, he got Francis to agree to spring for the money. So now the two of them are in, this is the very day that Francis was to fly to Thunder Bay with the check that he was going to give to me, that I was going to give to city council. Uh, and Jack calls, uh, Around, I don't know, two in the afternoon, they say, Gary, we have a problem. Uh, uh, the mayor, Walter, had called the minister directly and he laced them like Mr. Fox had never been laced before. And the mayor made a promise that if he showed up that day with a check, the mayor was personally going to take a broomstick and put it, uh, and I'll just leave it at that. So, so Minister Fox didn't know what to do. He walks down to Jack, says, we have an issue. They leave the chamber. One minute later, Pierre comes racing out of the chamber and really levels it to the two of them, using swear words that are uh, honorable in places like Thunder Bay, uh, but not necessarily in the uh, in uh, Parliament, and uh, because they had walked out while Pierre was on his feet, and you just didn't do that in Pierre's government. So uh, this could have had a horrible ending, but thankfully, thankfully, it didn't, and cooler heads prevailed, and he came with the check, and that's the end of that, that point. But you can see all through this crazy drama that no one would ever think of unless you were living it, because it's crazy.
but you know, welcome to democracy. So now we're at point 16, uh, and we have to build it. And this is the point where I cleverly left town because I got a job as a vice president out west, and uh, Dr. Charles Johnson, who pro probably delivered a fair number of the people in this room, uh, took over and did a great job along with Clint, and the thing was built exactly as we said, on time, on budget, and to rave reviews. Which then takes us to point 17, which is opening night. Opening night, October 16th, 1985. And, uh, you know, the, the people included Maureen Forrester, Karen Kane, uh, and I drove down from Winnipeg with the family and uh, got dressed, ready to go, and I didn't go. I just couldn't go. For I think the only time in my life, emotions just took control. And uh, the, the truth is, I didn't step inside the auditorium for 30 years. Uh, and, uh, but I was glad I did on September 16th, 2015, when we were raising money for the Health Research Institute with the three tenor concert. And, uh, and Bob Halverson somehow learned that I was in the audience and he put the spotlight on me and introduced me and I got a great standing ovation that went on forever and it was very nice. But it took 30 years for me to make that trip. By the way, one guest who emceed that night, one guest. No, good guess. Rick Smith. Exactly right. Which takes me to point 18, reputation. So I don't know whether the people in Thunder Bay appreciate the reputation of your auditorium, as it's called. So I have two quick anecdotes about that. Uh, one night, when I was president of Red River College in Winnipeg, my first presidency, and uh, we went to see Loretta Lynn in the uh, Winnipeg Concert Hall, which is a great concert hall, and which Russell Johnson uh, did the acoustics. And of course, you know, she's a superstar and she was great. Uh, and if you like country music, which Lois did, I didn't quite appreciate it at the time. I like it better now. But anyway, Loretta Lynn was doing her thing. She was incredible. And about halfway through, she stops. And she said, I want to congratulate the people of Winnipeg for this fantastic concert hall. I mean, it's really great. And of course, she got a great applause. And then out of the blue, she says, but last night, last night, Frank, where were we last night? It's Thunder Bay. She's right, Thunder Bay. The drummer knew where they were. Loretta didn't. And she said, now that's a concert hall. <laughs> From the great Loretta Lynn herself. And not too long after that, I found myself in the Valhalla. And who's there having breakfast? Harry Belafonte after having just done a concert the night before. So of course, you know, blah, blah. And he said, and you, you may have heard him quoted as having said this, and not just to me, he said, I don't know why they call it an auditorium. That place is a concert hall. It's fantastic. And he said that publicly uh, a number of times. And so, uh, you know, the, the truth is, it is going to, the late and great uh, Russell, it is the greatest multi-purpose uh, concert hall in North America. The Europeans don't make multi-purpose halls, so that's a different story. Uh, but we caught Russell at the peak of his powers. Right? He had done all those other great halls, but when we caught him, he really knew all about geometry and all about materials and all about technology. And it was sheer luck that we caught him at that moment. And so you have the finest multi-purpose auditorium uh, in North America, according to lots of people, including Harry Belafonte. So that leads me to my last point, 19, uh, which is about the name. There's nothing wrong with the name. We named it that. 
Thunder Bay Community Auditorium. But I don't believe it does it justice because it's more than an auditorium. I spent many evenings at Selkirk in its auditorium, and it's a great high school auditorium. And I saw Charles Lawton there and, and uh, Lo uh, Lois Marshall, a number of great concerts that used to take place there. But uh, nobody at Selkirk would feel that their auditorium is a concert hall. But your auditorium is a concert hall. So I'm wondering, why not change the name? Instead of TBCA, why not call it TBCH, Thunder Bay Concert Hall? And some people, when they're deciding about their itinerary, these are the superstars, stuff like that, little details like that matter. They might go to a 1,500-seat concert hall whereas they may not go to a 1,500-seat auditorium. Anyway, uh, whatever you name it, it is what it is. It's a gift, and you're a gift for being here tonight, so thank you very much. So, uh, any questions? Rob? Well, I've heard it said... Uh, Gary, that we have the, we're the number we're number three in acoustics in North America. Is that is that true? Are we number one? Are we number three? Is there a measurement? So there is a measurement. I'm not Russell Johnson, and he's not with us anymore to comment. Um, <clears throat> but uh, my understanding. So if we're talking about multi-purpose, then I believe last I heard we were number one. Now, if you're comparing us to Carnegie Hall or you know, one or two places like that, I can't comment. What's your single purpose? They're, they're essentially single purpose, right? But whether you're one or two or three, for, top, for Thunder Bay to be in the top three against New York and L.A. and Chicago and Toronto and Montreal, that's not bad. Dallas. Where was the original uh, site? The original site? I'm always embarrassed to say it. It was in downtown Fort William on the uh, parking lot. You know, there's Patterson Park yeah. and there's a parking lot. It's, it was there, right there. So, of course, the current site has more land. It's sort of between the two former cities, sort of, uh, whereas the other one was squarely in Fort William. So uh, it, it's just better. And it's near the, the uh, Canada Games Complex, and you can do stuff together. And it's, it's just a much better site. So the senator got it right. Okay. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for doing this, because just this journey tonight of listening to your uh, tenacity to keep it going. So I thank you and all the people that work so diligently on this effort because, um, I mean, I grew up in Thunder Bay, moved away for 10 years, moved back, and one of the highlights of living here is being able to go to our concert hall. And right. we call it concert hall from now on because of you. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. <laughs> Rob, again. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering if I could anecdotally tell you an opportunity that it gave me because it exists. Yes. So we, we did a history of the company for the 85th anniversary, and one of the pictures in the book was a picture of one of our ships on the Detroit on the Chicago River, because we used to deliver paper to the Chicago Sun Times. Yes. And there was it was a Christmas time, and there was a show on the on the ship which included Bob Hope. Yes. So when we went to the opening, well, he came for the opening. Just after. Just after. So right. when we went to that and I was able to go to the after party on the stage. I had my book with me. Oh, okay. And I asked him, um, you know, do you remember this? And he said, no. I said, would you sign the page? And right. He did. Yeah. He signed the page. So that was an opportunity that you gave. Well, for those who don't know, Rob is the senator's grandson. And that's the connection. Uh, I suspect Andy Coffey had something to do with bringing Bob Hope to Thunder Bay because somehow or other, they were best buds. So uh, anyway, it was good that he came. 
Uh, yes, Scott. There are several questions coming in from our online uh, viewers tonight. Uh, so the first one um, is, what was the final budget to build the auditorium? 12 million, just under 12 million. Okay. Uh, another um, question from uh, Nicole Gallagher. Uh, can you comment on the community fundraising? For example, who bought nameplates on the seats? Well, we had one. <laughs> I think it cost three hundred dollars. Five hundred. Oh my goodness! Yeah. So the, the the bottom line answer is everybody, common people. You know, uh, Chuck Carter wasn't going to buy a a plaque on the seat. He might buy uh, the auditorium or something. But uh, everyday teachers, nurses. Uh, bushwhackers, uh, city uh, employees, everybody, teachers, everybody uh, stepped up to the plate, and it really is a uh, an everybody adventure. Another question. Yeah, uh, one more. Uh, what tips did, do you have to seek approval from city council on supporting capital projects designed to improve quality of life? For residents/slash visitors to Thunder Bay. Well, of course, uh, one way of answering that is I have no I have no advice for City Hall. None. T to me, uh, people who have the guts to, especially in this day of social media, which is so brutal, people who have the guts to stand up to uh, everything it takes to be a public servant certainly have my, my respect. Uh, but as it turns out, I do have my letter that I wrote in the Chronicle Journal after uh, I announced that I was leaving town. And I'll read one paragraph. I wasn't intending to read it, but I'll read it in response to that question. Uh, so this was a nine point letter. And uh, point G is as follows. There are a total denial of uh, democracy as we know it. Oh, I'm speaking about referendums. Sorry. Referenda are a total denial of democracy as we know it. Uh, and as it has served this nation well. In a true democracy, citizens and groups define their priorities and elect politicians to fulfill these according to an agreed upon plan. The process holds the politicians accountable to the people and enables us to achieve things as a community, which we could not otherwise achieve as individuals. So I'm half done. Everyone is a good neighbor, living in a spirit of cooperation and fair play. In this tried and true form of democracy, the residents of West Fort help build a rec complex in Current River, and the rec users of Current River help subsidize mass transit to Nibi. And the business riders, uh, uh, sorry, the bus riders of Nibi help pave the roads of Northwood. And the symphony goers of Northwood help build a ball diamond in McKellar. And the ball players of McKellar help pitch in for an auditorium. So uh, I'm not smart enough to give advice, but I would say listening is a good start until you really understand what people are saying, always be respectful, and only then should you get into the business of negotiations and decisions. So that would be my answer for what it's worth. Any other questions, Scott, from online? Not from online. None of my grandchildren? <laughs> well, we'll give them a moment to finish typing their, their questions. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. Well, folks, uh, I believe I believe, Scott, we're done, right? Unless, unless you would really like to keep talking. I'm sure everyone would be happy to hear that. <laughs> no, I think I'm done. Last chance, questions, comments, going once, twice. Thank you very much, folks, for your attention. God bless you all. So thank you, everyone, uh, for coming tonight. Um, if you enjoyed tonight's presentation and you're not already a member of the Thunder Bay Historical Museum Society, I would encourage you to think about that on your way out.
And I would uh, like to point out that the museum's classic car raffle is, is now going on. Um, so you can buy tickets by visiting our website. Um, there's a link on our homepage to get you to the ticket buying uh, area. So it is a 1979 Pontiac uh, Esprit Redbird edition. Uh, so beautiful car. So do please check that out. Um, a couple of programs that are going on right now that I wanted to, uh, to plug to the audience since I have the microphone you can't escape. Uh, the Thunder Bay Museum is partnering with uh, Professor Sally Talagamont and the Ontario Dialects Project. Please do look that up online. The universe, it's from the University of Toronto and the Department of Linguistics. And they're conducting oral history interviews this summer from July 13th to July 16th. And the Thunder Bay Museum would like to invite anyone who grew up and lives in Thunder Bay or in Northwest Ontario to participate in these interviews. We also have a long-term oral history project uh, that the museum is working on, separate from the, uh, the previously mentioned one, and we are conducting, uh, that we are conducting, and we are seeking uh, participants as well from equity-seeking communities. So if you're interested in either one of these, please do reach out to, uh, to our staff, and especially Sarah, who's hiding in the back room, who's uh, done all the tech management for tonight's presentation. <laughs> So in closing, I would also like to thank the, the museum staff, our volunteers, and our contractors for making events uh, like tonight go off with uh, relatively without a hitch. So uh, a round of applause for all of the, uh, the staff here tonight who are staying late. For... So again, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, please do enjoy uh, the refreshments and each other's company. And thank you again. Good night.